research in music and acoustics that was started in the 70s. And they, um, they had these, this grand vision of things that would happen in the future with music technology. And, um, and right away tried to start putting this grand vision in place, all with sort of proprietary development. So they were developing this um, music computer that would let you do a sort of real-time digital stuff with audio. This is, this is a way that Max is um, confusing, and this is the point I wanted to get to. Data flow in Max is from right to left. And where things are in your patcher actually has a tangible effect. I can say, I want to have a pitch of 440, and I want to have a volume of uh, 0.3. Now, this will be different from me making volume of 1.3. Okay? You can have uh, as many arguments as you want to. Okay? Now, I can actually set this with the multiple parameters. Now, I have an LFO rate of 10. And my pitch is a 10, now let's make it 20. You can move this. Let's make this a little wider. Let's make it more wider. Alright, get somewhere now. Now, my routine is basically Using a little bit of stereo separation, kind of spread it out a little bit more. I like the Synoxys plugins for those kinds of things. Funny enough, I'm also using the Andy Kramer guitar uh, processor from the Waves plugins, just to kind of give it that extra drive. Here, without it, bring it in. Kind of gives it that extra grit that you wouldn't necessarily get out of the CS80. And then running it through a little bit of Logic Space Designer using a Canon setting to kind of give it that extra pulsiness. Running it through some bit crushing, more sausage fatter, a little bit of Transient Designer to help bring out the beater of the kick. A little what bit of Transient Designer do again? Adds the, um, it gives a little bit more punch on the transient. So if you think about the transient of the, of the sound is the attack of the sound. So it's how fast the attack responds. So what the transient designer does is it kind of sharpens the attack. By how much you turn uh, the knob on the top, that's how much the attack gets added. You can also dumb down the attack. So if you want something to have like a smoother, duller attack, you can pull it back. Typically, that's not how people use it. But then you also can increase the sustain level too. So you can really do some. Nice stuff to help bring out the game. I create another number box here. And I say I don't want it to output numbers every 500 milliseconds. I want it to output random numbers every uh, 50 milliseconds. Then... Right. Spacebar now and hello there. Okay, so now it made this 2D picture of my voice. And the composition is that it's bringing in, it's turning this 2D thing into a 3D thing. Okay? And Now the red timeline is 
is set to speed up and slow down and go forward and backward based on what I want it to do. It's, it's like, it's a time difference in terms of like, so you have, a, you, have a, you have a picture of like where all your settings are at one particular point, right? Yeah. So think of all your knobs are like all turned here. That ramp will, depending on how much time you give it, when you, when you take a snapshot of that, of all those settings, mm -hmm. and then you change all those settings to something different, and then you take another snapshot, that ramp just gives you the amount of time that it'll slide between those two settings. And is that something you trigger, or is that something that Yeah, you all you, you trigger it just by clicking on the different buttons up in this grid here. Okay. Find these two uh, sine waves to this, and then you can draw on here. simply adding a certain level of modulation to this, I can really start to um, take that very basic wave file and use it to create some interesting sound fields or textures, you know, and I, I can control those, I can, I can speed that up, I can change the pitch here. Well, let's actually draw the speakers here. 
So we have stickers here. Now, I have a sign, left, right, left around, right around, okay. and if you actually are trying to compose a multi-channel piece, I don't know what you're about, but first thing in my mind is, oh, you know what, I'm going to actually make my sound go around like that, and <laughs> make something like this, and I have like, like this, you know, it's kind of like, you know, kind of like natural, I know, this childish instinct of, okay, I want to make something flat. Now, when you, when you actually plan to compose something for the multi-channel, it's not just you are adding two speakers for that, but just kind of think of all these things, presence and the, uh, the, 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 what you actually want to, uh, what your audience actually want to hear. I'm sitting here on a, one of the ideal spots getting that, but remember, in the concert hall, there will be somebody actually sitting over there, there will be sitting over, somebody over there, somebody will be actually sitting right in front of the speaker, and you don't want to blow up their ears, right? Multi-channel speakers, multi-channel music cannot, well, you can see me, but it's really hard to actually, you can perceive in a stereo, okay? And, you know, it's gotta actually be, have to be played in a room or a concert large, large hall.